I want you to stand, actually, if you would, in honor of God and of his word. And we're going to jump right into the middle of chapter 2. Actually, what I'm going to do today is kind of cream Daniel 2. As we re-enter Daniel, we've been away for four months, uh, but I'm excited to get back into Daniel. And we'll cream chapter 2, and then we'll go back and ransack it. <laughs> we'll look at everything. There's a lot here, but uh, Daniel 2, Lord, as we turn to your word right now, we ask you, by your Holy Spirit who pinned this, to speak to us. And I am so thankful that we have your word in our mother tongue. And we're grateful for those who labor to uh, get the word of God into all the different languages that have been so confused since the Tower of Babel. Oh, Lord, uh, may we have ears to hear right now. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting at verse uh, 17. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends. That takes a little bit of context. <laughs> Daniel, you know, was kidnapped by a brutal Gentile invasion of Israel where they were raped and murdered and the siege and the we looked at it in chapter 1 it was dark days he was kidnapped probably as a teenager never saw his family again probably but he's in exile in Babylon and God has blessed him he set his heart he made up his mind to live for God regardless and it was in dark days that he was living for God, and God honored that, and he's in a position of power under the king now. But the king, Nebuchadnezzar, has a dream, and the richest man in the world, the most famous man in the world, the strongest man in the world, he would pose himself as, Nebuchadnezzar, is troubled in spirit. He's anxious. You know, by the way, you can have all the money in the world. You can, have, you can be at the top of the heap in your field uh, and still have no freedom, really freedom, real freedom, and be at unrest. And Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know what this dream meant. He sensed it was important. And he wanted to know what the dream and the interpretation. And he went to the wise men and they said, well, tell us the dream and we'll tell you the interpretation. He was getting on to them. He said, no, you tell me the dream and the interpretation. Well, they said, well, nobody could do that. And they said, tell us the dream, we'll tell you the interpretation. He said, no, tell me the dream that I had. These frauds <laughs> were exposed. Uh, but not before he said, unless you can tell me the dream and the interpretation, I'm going to kill all of you. I, and to let you know the kind of world Daniel was living in, he was considered one of these he was in that category. And he said, I'll tear you limb from limb and destroy your house and your family. The whole group. The tyranny. What's wrong with this world? We say today, and it was always wrong. Uh, it was wrong back in Daniel's day. Well, anyway, Daniel got the news that he was, his head was on the block. And read with me now, verse 17. <clears throat> Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter in order that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his friends might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then God blessed, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. 
For wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you've given me wisdom and power. Even now, you've made known to me what we requested of you. You've made known to us the king's matter. Lord, may we hear these words. May we recognize this is your word. Amen. You can be seated. One year ago, Israel, surrounded by world powers, was brutally attacked, Uh, murder, rape, almost, in fact, on the anniversary a couple weeks ago of that brutal attack when 1,200 were murdered. That would be like... Population-wise, that would be like 40,000 Americans. Um, 254 hostages were taken, 46 of which, by the way, 12, I should say, 46 Americans were killed in that attack. 12 were taken hostage among the 254 hostages. Uh, The murder, the rape... The unspeakable depravity. That's what our Secretary of State said on the anniversary about two weeks ago. The depravity of it is almost unspeakable. We don't use that word very often, do we? In fact, most of us, in our culture, we don't talk about depravity. We say men are pretty good. But when things like that erupt, the depravity is almost unspeakable. Well, just last Thursday... The mastermind of that vicious, evil, wicked attack was killed. But, uh, of course, there'll be another evil terrorist just pop up in his place. Uh, I'm thankful uh, that he is no longer here, but we know how it'll go. There will be another one. And in fact, anti-Semitism, as this vicious attack happened, hatred of Israel broke out around the world and on our college campuses. Not hatred of those who attacked them, but hatred of Jews. Um, And it continues. And ever since October 7th, actually a year ago, <clears throat> it's been on my mind. You know, our Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, I'm quoting out of Luke 21, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, when you see these things begin to take place, lift up your heads. Your redemption is drawing Near. I've had a hard time uh, speaking about anything without that context this last year. We forget quickly. We, we move on to the next news, etc. But I'll tell you what. Uh, you can't listen to the news and not know things are still a tinderbox over there. And when you see these things begin to happen, lift up your heads. Jesus said, your redemption draws near. Since then, I preached a series on hope. I spoke for several weeks out of Isaiah, another series in Isaiah 55. I spoke on Jesus is coming to the men's breakfast, and then we did the men's retreat, Jesus is coming, and then we swept through Revelation by way of introducing Daniel, because Daniel is this great prophetic book written 600 BC that collaborates, you might say, or corroborates or is so consistent with the final book of the Bible, Revelation. And so we 
swept through Revelation by way of introducing Daniel. And uh, we launched into Daniel in May, if you're new with us. And we got six weeks in, one chapter. And uh, outdoor services happened, and so we took a break. So we're coming back after four months to chapter two. We're going to re-enter Daniel. That was a year ago, when you think about that. Four weeks ago, um, we, Chris and I were surprised and humbled and honored by you and the elders and the words you spoke to us, uh, marking the 45th anniversary of our ministry here, and just your words and your love and your generosity to us, we were very humbled. And I want to say a loud thank you. It is a privilege to serve here. And uh, I can't believe it's been that long, but uh, we were very grateful for that. And actually, it coincides with, I'd talked about it a couple weeks earlier, our 50th wedding anniversary. And we actually thought about that uh, six months ago and started to plan a trip this fall, which we just got back from Thursday, and uh, for our 50th anniversary. And we had a great time, I got to tell you. Uh, <clears throat> we, we had never been really, I'd flown in and out of a couple of places, but I'd never really been through Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. And we said, it'd be great to be down there. In fact, a dear friend of ours who goes way back with us, a good friend of Chris in college and me, uh, who went to Africa with us in, in 1978. Uh, and we felt as we were there in 78, we felt called back to America. And she felt called to Africa and has ministered in Africa and then the Ukraine and had a very fruitful ministry in both places and long-term ministry in Ukraine where God has done so much in the Ukraine over these years. And we need to pray for that part of our world also. But she is from North Carolina, and she always said, you guys come out and see North Carolina. And she's retired now, and, and so we went out there thinking, hey, we'll see uh, North Carolina and the mountain people that she came from. And, and you know, four weeks ago, Helen hit. <laughs> and uh, this amazing storm that is so devastated that area. We were going to go to Asheville. We actually did go to Asheville, but not the way we expected to go to Asheville. And uh, the it changed everything, that storm. Changed everything quickly, overnight. And uh, I will tell you, we adjusted our plans right at the last minute as far as where we would go and that sort of thing. But I got to tell you, we had a great trip and we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. Uh, but we were very aware of the uh, situation there. And I won't bore you with the details of our trip, but I will tell you this, that uh, when we worshiped with those mountain people, it was rich. Uh, in particular... We remember, and we were talking about it on the, on the plane back from Nashville, just saying, what, what were the highlights? Uh, Chris mentioned that worship service that we were in in the mountains, the rural little town up in the mountains where the storm had merci mercifully not hit, but right around all the devastation. And, and uh, we were with that small congregation, and the preacher stood up, and it was as if, you know, the state of Oregon has been decimated. You really can't just stand up and say, well, today we're going to talk about... He talked about the storm. And he said, and that little church had given $10,000 for the relief of some of their relatives, their acquaintances. I mean, you know, it's very real. Um, but he preached about the storm. And then he preached, after expressing their heart and praying for those who are hurting, he said, the storm is coming, the real storm. And he chose for his text Revelation 6 and Revelation 16. And I think it might have been a little bit, I don't know, 
For me, in Oregon, maybe I, it might have been tasteless for me to do that, but it spoke with power. As he said, the storm is coming. These people didn't expect that, but it's coming, and it's inescapable. And you know, the scripture does say, by the way, yet once more he will shake the earth, Hebrews 12. And the storm is coming. So uh, that was a very memorable time for us. And I picked up this out of the USA Today. Just listen to this. It can be said with safety that no such damage has ever been brought by flood in the western half of North Carolina. Well, by the way, uh, USA didn't get that right. Uh, we also visited the Ark encounter. And damage from the flood in Oregon, North Carolina, and everywhere. Uh, but the world forgets. We forget that, don't we? Anyway, the newspaper said, and I, I appreciate what it said, it can be said with safety that no such damage has ever been brought by flood in the western half of North Carolina. Indeed, no one thought this section of the state could ever suffer such damage. And that's the USA Today quoting the Winston-Salem Journal in July of 1916. There had been a flood much like this one 100 years ago. And in fact, in that article, I saw the black and white grainy pictures of Marshall, North Carolina, which was very close to where we were, just devastated in 1916, and then a color picture right beside it with the same situation, same at camera angle and everything. One building remained the same, and you could just see the devastation. And I thought to myself, history repeats itself. And someone said, the one thing we learn from history, and we ought to learn from history, the one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. <laughs> um, I share that. And then I say, let's get back into Daniel 2. Uh, Daniel 2. There is a God in heaven. I know that's the title of this whole book, but it's also the title of what I want to say today. There is a God in heaven. So as we reenter Daniel, I'll just remind you that we looked at his times, devastating times, hard times, dark times, wicked times. Uh, we looked at Daniel the prophet. He wrote 600 years roughly, B.C., before Christ. And he gave an amazing sweep. And as you read Daniel, and I encourage you to re-enter if you haven't been reading it, get back in, because we're going to have a great time in Daniel. And as he, he sweeps through history, God revealed to him a great sweep of world history all the way to the end. And he says, these are quotes right out of Daniel, the time of the end, he keeps repeating. The appointed time of the end. The final period of indignation. And so when we looked at Revelation, which explains that same time, uh, we talked about the final period of indignation that's going to be unleashed on this world. Well, Daniel is speaking of these things till the end. When Christ will return. And Daniel, the man, we looked at his times, we looked at him as the prophet. Then we looked at Daniel, the man, I think we took three weeks on him because it'd be easy to get our eyes on Daniel, the man. He lived in that kind of darkness with boldness and strength and joy and peace. And you say, how could he? Because Daniel knew his God. He knew in fact, if we started to get occupied with Daniel, I'm of the persuasion that he would say, 
There's a God in heaven. And in fact, I'm not just speculating. Look at verse 28. When Nebuchadnezzar said, you mean you can tell me what my dream was and the interpretation? Daniel said, no, nobody could. But there's a God in heaven. Daniel knew God. And he's the one who wrote, by the way, in chapter 11, that the people who know their God will display strength and take action. And Daniel <clears throat> is, uh, we're going to see a lot of things from his life as we go through his prophecies and as we walk through his book. But today, as I said, I just kind of want to cream chapter 2, just glean some thoughts because this is where he says, hey, there's a God in heaven. And I tell you today, in a world that ignores God, there's a God in heaven. What's he like? What's he like? I had a, at least a three and a half hour conversation on Thursday on the plane. Uh, the guy, I was sitting in the middle, Chris is on the window, and I'm kind of tired and I'm looking to read, and he's doesn't give me any eye contact and he starts reading off his iPad and looking at pictures and then started reading but about an hour into the flight we were both kind of ignoring each other but he got up to stretch and I got up to stretch and and I said uh, is Portland your home because we're going Nashville to Portland he said no Corvallis and boy he was off and running he was a talkative we had a great conversation uh, for the next three hours. Uh, but he said, and he was almost like an evangelist. He said, uh, I'm reading a book, and it's really interesting. And he started telling, he told me the name and the author, and he was reading. When he heard that we'd, what we'd done, gone to Charleston, Savannah, and looked at some of the stuff that happened in our nation's history with slavery and that sort of thing. He, he was reading a book about that period before the Civil War, and he was telling me about it, and, I, and he said, it reminds me, he said, of what's happening today in our country. And I said, yeah. I said, history repeats itself, doesn't it? And he said, yeah. And so we had quite a talk, but... Uh, when I say there's a God in heaven, he, I asked him about his background spiritually. He said, oh, he said, I was raised in a church, but I've, I've recovered from that. <laughs> and I said, oh, I see. I have a friend that calls himself a recovering Lutheran. And he said, well, I'm a recovering Catholic, you know. And he said, it's taken me quite a while to recover. He's deconstructing his faith. And he didn't use that term, but that's a popular term to use today. Uh, you can deconstruct out of false faith, religious faith. And he'd been very religious as a kid, but he'd come out here to Oregon and he had a spiritual awakening when he saw the Douglas fir. And so we had quite a visit. And he said, this is my spiritual home out here. And I asked him, well, what's your background spiritual? He told me the church, but he said he no longer believes that mythology. And I thought, wow, there's a God in heaven. And so after we'd talked maybe two hours, I don't know, I said, how's that working for you? I said, uh, what makes you tick? And why are you here? Could I ask you those things? And he said, sure. He said, boy, that, that's two different questions. And I said, yeah, I suppose it is. He said, what makes me tick? And he thought, and he said, well, I... And he explained to me that he's lived a good life. And he's lived according to the Judeo-Christian ethic. And he said, so I guess that's what makes me tick. And he said, now, as to that other question, he thought, he was thinking, why am I here? And he said, and he pondered it quite a while. 
And he said, I don't know. I don't know. He's 75 years old. Maybe you are here. If you don't recognize the God in heaven, the one and only true God, the God of revelation, you don't even know why you're here. Is this all just a... Did it just happen? He would told me all about nature and the way things work. He's really in. He's a professor at the university, and he understands how why th- not why but how things work a little bit. And he, I said you, and he said I I believe in evolution. I said you do, and he said well yeah, and I said really, after what you've told me. The intricacy and detail of the way things work, it all just happened. And he understood what I was saying. And he paused and he said, well, he said, actually, I guess it takes quite a bit of faith to believe that it all just happened. And I said, it takes a ton of faith. But I tell you today, there is a God in heaven, and we can know why we're here. And we're not here just to tick off 60, 70, 80 years trying to do the best we can. For what reason? No. There's a God in heaven. And what I want to do is just quickly glance at... uh, this God in heaven. Out of chapter 2, out of the text we read, we'll just glance at it. Seven truths regarding this God. He's a God of revelation. He's the one and only true God, secondly. Thirdly, to this God belong wisdom and power. This God, fourth, is in charge of history. Fifthly, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And sixth, this God, this king, can and should be prayed to. And seventhly, this God can and should be worshipped. Don't worship the trees. Don't worship the creature. Worship the creator. Well, uh, let's just glance at it. This God is a God of revelation. I'll just, we'll come back, as I said, and really ransack this chapter because it's got a lot for us. Uh, if you think this is, you know, what chapter two is about, there's a lot in chapter two that we'll come back. But I want to just look at this text with you and just glance. There is a God in heaven. And we can know what he's like. He's a God of revelation. When Daniel faced a challenge, and it was a challenge, wasn't it? He was going to be destroyed. And he and his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, renamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar tried to change everything about them. But they were going to be torn limb from limb. That's a challenge. I don't know what you're facing today. But I can tell you this, you can do what Daniel did because God is a God of revelation. He got his friends, notice verse 18, to request compassion from the God of heaven. And it is he, verse 22, look at it, the God of heaven. It is he who reveals God is a God of revelation. He doesn't leave himself over in the dark where you and I have to search for him. He's made himself known. He visited the planet. He came. That's why we say B.C. 600, before Christ. We date our calendars by him. He's a God of revelation. And from the first verse onward, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. From the first verse onward, he's been revealing 
himself. God has spoken. And Jesus Christ, when he faced challenges, when he faced questions, he would go right back. They said, what about this thing, divorce and remarriage? What about, what about marriage and, and divorce and, and the issues of Jesus' day? They, they came to him and he said, haven't you read? And he'd go right back to Genesis. And he did, Matthew 19. From the beginning, he said, God created us male and female. By the way, after I'd talked maybe, well, actually, Chris got involved too. I took a break. And they were talking gardening. This guy knew about a lot of, a lot of stuff about a lot of things. And he was talking to it. He was more than happy to share it with you. But I'm telling you, uh, it, was, it was interesting to me because uh, he, he brought up this one flower. Chris brought up this flower from Hawaii. And he said, he knew all about it. He said, oh, yeah. He said, that, I said, that's it. And I actually, I said, is that that one that in our backyard just is pretty? And they're all pretty, but <laughs> that's about what I know about flowers. But anyway, yeah, it's this one. And I said, that is spectacular. And he said, yeah, and he gave me an elbow. He said, God did a pretty good job on that one, huh? <laughs> he, 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 and, and I turned and he said, he made a pretty good one, huh? And they said, or she, and I said, no, he. <laughs> said, in the first page it says, he created us male and female. You see, the world doesn't know anything about him because they don't want to listen to what he says. They know plenty, really. But we don't have to guess about God. He always represents himself as he. And he created us, male and female, in his image. And I'm not saying that God doesn't picture himself as a tender mother caring or a, a, a hen brooding over her chicks. But I'm telling you, we can know who God is. We can know what he's like. And we don't have to speculate. His word gives us clarity of mind from the first verse to the end, right? Don't add to his words, Revelation 22 says. And don't subtract from his words. Tremble at his words. I, I, I'll leave it at that. God is a God of revelation. Secondly, and by the way, this God of revelation can reveal the future just as easily as he has the past. <laughs> He's the creator of time. He's the governor. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the God of history. So he can speak about the future, and he does. We're going to see it in Daniel. It's exciting. And he speaks just as easily about the future and the end as he does the beginning. I'll tell you how it started. In the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth, God says. He's a God of revelation. But secondly, he is the one and only true God. Nebuchadnezzar was forced to, I think I'd say, concede this. Look over at verse 40, what is it, 40... Uh, Six. After Daniel told him his dream and the interpretation, Nebuchadnezzar was forced to concede. Maybe we could use the word confess, but I don't think so, unless we use it in kind of that confess under duress way we use English word confess. But then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and a fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you've been able to reveal this mystery. Nebuchadnezzar was forced <laughs> to admit it. He's the one and only true God. The Bible reverberates with this truth. There's false gods. Don't bow down to a piece of wood you carved, God says. 
Don't bow down to a God you made up in your own imagination. There are false gods. They're demons. But there's one and only, the one and only true God. And I mean capital G. I asked my new friend on the plane, I said, have you ever, um," because he's real red, and he was telling me about this book he's reading, and he's reading lots of things, and he knows a lot of things. I said, have you ever, since you kind of escaped your, the mythology, you know, have you ever read the life of Jesus Christ as written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And he said, no, no, I, I never have. I said, well, you know, men have tried to create a perfect piece of art or in literature try to write a perfect individual. And even if you treat something as fiction, men have tried to like paint a perfect picture and it's always got a flaw because there's a flaw in the artist. And there's, it's, men have been unable to write a perfect man. Even fictionalized. Just make one up. But Matthew is a tax collector, I told him. Mark is a young friend of Peter. Luke was a medical doctor. And John was a commercial fisherman. And all four of them wrote of a perfect man. He said, yeah, you can learn a lot from fiction. That's kind of where he was. I said, how did they do it? And I think it gripped him a bit. And I challenged him to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because faith comes from hearing and hearing from this one who has spoken and is the one and only true God. Thirdly, to this God, look at verse 20. To this God belong power and wisdom. To this God belongs wisdom. And power. He gives wisdom to those who ask. You want to know what life is all about? You want to know what, why you're here? And what you should be up to? You, know, you want to know why you tick? What you should tick for? Listen to God. He'll give you wisdom. And he exercises power on behalf of those who love him. He'll shut the mouths of lions. And he did. He'll be with you in the fiery furnaces of life. And he was. And he will be. He said, I'll never leave you. Though you go through the fire, I will be with you. Would you like to know what your life is all about? Would you like to live with no fear? (laughs) To live with not that dread of what's coming around the next corner? He gives wisdom, and he exercises power on our behalf. Fourth, he's in charge of history. Look at verse 21. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. We're in the middle of an election, and boy, maybe I should preach on the election. It's only eight days away or whatever. But I'll tell you this. I know who's in charge of history, who removes kings and establishes kings. And in Daniel, we're going to see several kings learn that the hard way. (laughs) And by the way, all kings and presidents and CEOs of corporations and blue-collar guys, all are one day going to learn who this God really is. We can know him today. Do you know him? He is in charge of history. Look over at chapter 4 just for a second. The last verse of chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of kings. (laughs) He was the top of the pile. And God humbled him. God took his mind away. And we've never seen that happen. (laughs) We are so frail. I don't care how big, powerful, what office you hold, how much money you have. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind for seven years 
and God humbled him. And look at the last verse he learned. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven for all his works are true and his ways just. And he is able to humble those who walk in pride. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. He's able to humble those who walk in pride. And I'll tell you, we're going to learn lots of things like that in this book, but I couldn't resist but see it here right in this little passage of Daniel's prayer. By the way, he's able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that you can ask or think. He is able, just trace that phrase through your scripture, Christian. He is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Did you know that, Christian? He's able to keep you saved. He's able to save forever, Hebrews 7.25. He is able to sympathize with us, Hebrews 2.17. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. Fifthly, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And his kingdom... Look over now back at chapter 2. Look at verse 44. When Daniel gives the sweep of the world kingdoms, which we'll go back and look at, when the final king arises, <laughs> when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, when the stone cut out of the mountain made without hands, when the divine king reigns, his kingdom endures forever. All the other kingdoms come and go. Man has this great plan to make a great society or a great kingdom or a thousand year God is going to establish his kingdom forever and ever. Verse 44, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. But it will itself endure forever. That's a recurring theme, by the way. The kingdoms of the Bible, the kingdoms of history, they come and go. And they're, just as they're getting strong, another one comes in. But God's kingdom will never end. Aren't you glad? He's the king of kings and lord of lords, and his kingdom endures forever. Six, this king should be prayed to. Look at verse 18, chapter 2. Daniel went to his friends, and he said, let's request compassion from the God of heaven. And this wasn't um, a little scrap here in chapter 2. No, Daniel prayed, and we're going to see he was a man of prayer. In fact, when we looked at Daniel, the man in chapter 1, we realized he's a man of prayer. And he prayed, and God protected him. He prayed when it looked like it would lead to the lion's den, and it did. The king said, don't pray to anybody but me for the next 30 days. And he said, I'm keeping praying to the God of heaven. And he did. And chapter 9, by the way, if you want to pray for the election, you want to pray for America, and I encourage you to pray for America. And I encourage you to vote, and I encourage you to pray for the election. And as I said a couple, a few weeks ago, we're not voting for a pastor. We're voting for a president and policies. And I'll tell you, educate yourself and vote. But pray, pray for America. And if you want a pattern for prayer for America, read chapter 9. Of Daniel. He confessed the sin as he pled God's mercy. And that's how I pray for our country. We have sinned. We need his mercy. And finally, the seventh thing this God can and should be worshiped. Look at verse 20. Then Daniel answered and said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. And he's going to be worshipped forever and ever. 
Are you going to be worshiping him forever and ever? Do you know him? You can live a life of peace and joy and strength and courage by trusting in him, praying to him, and living for him. Daniel trusted in the God of heaven. There's a God in heaven, and he trusted in him. He prayed to him, and he lived for him. And he's a pattern for us, for you and me. Do you know him? Oh, it's so easy in our world to avoid him. And you have to. But as we got up to go, the, my friend, my new friend, sitting next to me after a long flight, his wife was on the other side of the aisle. She sort of apologized. She said, I hope he didn't, didn't uh, I forget the word she used, but I hope he didn't, because she saw how he was just, you know, telling us about this book and that book and the next thing. And I said, no, no, not at all. I enjoyed it. And he said, he gave as good, well as he took, you know. And, and uh, but I said, now don't forget, read the life of Jesus. And he said, what? And I said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He said, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, I'll see you at baggage claim, you know. And, and, and then his, his final words that I heard him say was, I just hope I get reunited with my golf, golf clubs. And I thought, that's a picture of life, isn't it? We can think about what really counts, but then we're back to, I sure hope my clubs got on the flight with me. And I say, don't hear a sermon like this, hey, interesting things about God, and then just go back to your golf clubs or the World Series or the news or, no. Do you know him? And if you do, then you know what I mean when I say you can trust him. Your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And you can pray to him about everything. Are you anxious? Are you worried? You don't have to stay anxious. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to him. Tell him what's on your heart. Pray to him and live for him. Lord, we praise you that you are indeed a God, the God of revelation. That you are the one and only God. There's none like you. Oh, we are glad to say you... You are the source of all wisdom and real power. You're in charge of history. You are indeed the God of gods and King of kings. You're the sovereign. And we're so thankful that we can come right to you anytime, anywhere in Jesus' name. And we praise you. We thank you that we can worship you. We love you because you first loved us. Oh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.